Hey, what's up everybody and welcome to Found Flicks. On this Eating Explained, we're looking at the latest in the sprawling Saw franchise, Spiral, from the Book of Saw. Following a detective and his rookie partner that take charge of an investigation into grisly murders that resemble the work of the infamous Jigsaw Killer. So with this Saw series, after so many entries, it becomes pretty obvious about what to expect, as they never much deviated from the same formula with diminishing returns. Especially by the seventh and sort of original finale of the series, things were more than stale, and it was certainly time to change things up a bit. Then there was the half-hearted attempt to do just that in Jigsaw, but it failed by still feeling like more of the same. I actually rewatched that before watching Spiral, and I was like, oh man, this sucks. It seems like there was no life left in the series, or would have to let go of some of its trademarks to survive. Again, you know the drill if you've seen enough of these things. You got a bunch of bad people in some kind of dingy warehouse, traps that kill them in horrific ways, Billy the Puppet laying out the rules for you, pig mask followers, and of course, a massive earth-shattering, occasionally logic-defying final twist, which in the later movies usually was some way to shoehorn John into the bigger story. Thankfully for Spiral, it truly feels more like a spin-off, which is a good thing. So when it comes to how it connects to the others up to this point, it really doesn't. Beyond that, Jigsaw was a killer, all that stuff did happen, and certainly this copycat killer is inspired by Kramer. Beyond that, it abandons the series' convoluted story, and there is no on-screen appearance by John outside of some photos. Spiral sort of changes the overall flavor of the series, acting more as a police procedural mystery. While cops have always been featured heavily in the story, here it really is front and center as the new killings are investigated. And this change for the most part does work. Although I do admit to missing the bunch of strangers in a warehouse getting killed aspect, always up the body count, you know? If one thing that does feel a bit lacking is the traps themselves, as there's really only a few in the entire movie. Regardless, this is a strong new direction for the franchise, much of it thanks single-handedly to Chris Rock's performance. Oh, Sam Jackson's good too. It's kind of interesting how the whole movie really does feel built entirely around his on-screen persona. I actually found him absolutely hysterical in this. I could see people finding him too jokey, but hey, his riffing was funny. And certainly the Saw series could use some laughs to lighten up things with all the people being ripped apart and everything, you know? All that to say, while not exactly what longtime Saw fans would be expecting, it is still ultimately able to balance that line of franchise hallmarks while also carving out something new for the series. It's certainly the best Saw in quite some time, which really isn't saying that much, and that alone is a victory for Spiral. It also does have quite a shocking and abrupt ending that leaves a ton of interesting implications and things to say that really is left without much resolution, and it shows us the stark difference between Kramer and our new killer. That's the most interesting side of the movie to explore to me just what makes the new killer tick and how he sort of mutates Jigsaw's ideas and philosophies. So let's check out Spiral from the Book of Saw, breaking down the story's twists and turns, along with looking at the new traps and explaining the ending and its implications that will no doubt be explored in the already greenlit Saw 10. And I'll also give some of my ideas of where to take the series going forward. So let's get splaining. The game begins in a pretty surprising location compared to the dingy warehouses that we're used to, outside at a carnival with fireworks and everything. We follow Detective Boswick, who is wearing quite a suit and hat, seriously styling. He's on the trail of a criminal, and probably wishing he wore something else, follows him down into the subway tunnels. A quick distraction from a dummy catches him off guard, and a pig mask wearing attacker renders him unconscious. He comes to with his tongue latched into an ornate vice of sorts, dangling precariously on a stepladder. A random TV on the ground glitches to life, the same pig mask figure informing him of his situation. Thanks to his unseemly history, he is here here to pay his dues. At least he's got a way out. All you gotta do is rip your tongue out before the rapidly approaching subway arrives. Choice is yours, live or die. But I gotta say, I don't think there's much of a chance here really. Even if you do get your tongue out of the thing here, it looks like it's probably gonna rip a lot more out is all that I'm saying. Kind of a damned either way scenario, which already conflicts with Kramer's wavering philosophy of there usually being at least some way of surviving. Doesn't matter much anyway, because the dude gets it loose right as the train smells mashes into him, splattering him to bits. We then meet Detective Zeke Barnes and longtime friend of Boz's, who is in the middle of something not exactly on the up and up. He's enlisted several criminals to rob some other criminals, which goes off without a hitch. That is until they make it to the garage and the cops descend upon them. You're kind of like, wait, is he a criminal or a cop? I'm confused. We soon come to understand what has turned him into such a maverick. He's been more or less ostracized by the rest of the precinct. It's all due to an incident 12 years ago. During the extra lenient 
recent times of what's called Prop 8, allowing officers perhaps too much freedom. Zeke's first ever partner, Pete, was interrogating a witness, and when it sounded like the man might implicate him in some way, he took matters into his own hands, murdering the guy in cold blood. He shrugs it off to Zeke that he had a gun, so no big deal, right? But Zeke knows that what he did was blankly wrong, and decided to, as they say, cross that line of blue silence. Pete was fired from the force, and his life was ruined, but, well, too bad. As for Zeke, what he did left the other officers with a bad taste in their mouths, unable to trust him, labeling him a rat. Hence why he's pulling off wacky crime capers to catch the bad guys. It's the only way he's got left. However, for Captain Garza, his increasingly erratic behavior has become a real problem. He's got to learn to play along with the others, or you're out of here. To prove her point, he's assigned a fresh-faced new partner, Will Shink. There's another shadow looming over Z, as his father used to be the chief for many years here, and is kind of a legend around these parts. As Will even says, this is all thanks to him. Soon after, a nice looking present arrives for Zeke. Inside is a USB stick with a welcome from the killer and photos of spirals, one of Kramer's favorite symbols. They recognize the location as a courthouse and the two set off to the location. Naturally, Zeke has been at this for a while and has become embittered and jaded, as always happens in cop movies, especially in marriage, his having gone to pot. Meanwhile, Will is young and idealistic with a newborn baby and everything. Zeke dismisses this all as temporary, pretty much feeling that years on the beat will eat you alive, man. At the courthouse, they discover another present containing Boz's tongue, learning that he was known for lying on the stand in court, by a wide margin more than any other officer. Well, it's the tongue thing. They know enough from the clues left behind that they are obviously dealing with a jigsaw copycat killer, but it is definitely not Kramer himself. He's long dead. Or is he? No, he's definitely dead. But it appears there is yet another disciple of his work afoot here. It's around this point that Zeke's dad Marcus pops back into the picture, pretty much breaking into his apartment to Zeke's surprise. He's here to offer his condolences about Boz, but Zeke is more upset that he's never around anymore. They don't have any kind of real relationship. Marcus is at least open to trying, offering to get some food sometime and go over his new case. Thanks to some security cameras, they find Boz's last known whereabouts, and hoping another in the area could have caught more. Two senior detectives pay a visit to a local business. He did catch the man Boz was chasing as well, the guy knowing him and where he hangs out, the burned down bread factory. Oh no, what happened to the bread factory? Rather than involving Zeke, he ventures there on his own and right into the killer's mitts. He awakes in a tub of water, his fingers all encased in tight sleeves, attached to some serious looking wires and gears. This game is simple, just rip off all your fingers before a live wire reaches the water and electrocutes you. Easy peasy, right? Again, not really. And as expected, he horrifically loses all of his fingers and gets electrocuted. This one was pretty gruesome, but also just odd. I mean, where does the killer come up with this weird shit? Even the setup and the fingers and everything, what is going on there? And how does he, where does he get the money to buy all this stuff? I mean, geez louise. Things really kick into overdrive when Marcus does some snooping on his own at another abandoned building. But we don't know exactly why he's there at the moment. He too is taken by the killer. And after a few days visiting his empty apartment with no sign of him, him, Zeke grows worried. A new present from the killer leads them to another spot, and what looks like the whole force has shown up, finding the older detective's bloody badge. There's also the killer's little buddy, Mr. Snuggles, an adorable pig dressed as a cop, which, you know, pretty appropriate. But it turns out this is all just a distraction, as back at the precinct, Garza is alone and an easy target. The killer fills the place with gas, sending her down to the basement. Once locked down there, she's taken out in a fairly simple yet quite painful sounding method. Hot wax dripped right on her face, melting the skin on contact. And yeah, not sure how you'd win this one either. By the time Zeke reaches her, it's too late, growing more worried, but also potentially suspicious of his father's fate. Surprisingly, it also appears that Will is killed, following a clue of a bottle of paint found in a victim's body. He recognizes it as coming from a place that he and his train-obsessed father frequented when he was younger. It's no longer a hobby store, but a butcher now, discovering a flayed body in the back, sporting the same tattoo that we saw on Will. It's not much later until our pig mask friend comes for Zeke, him waking up in a familiar yet slightly different predicament. Handcuffed to a pipe with a nearby hacksaw, the reverse of Gordon from way back in the first film. Yet rather than having to saw his appendage off to get free, luckily there's a bobby pin nearby and he easily picks a lock. Much less messy than the alternative, that is for sure. Once free, he comes to his first test. The man he sold out, Pete, tied up with a tape recorder attached to him. He can choose to let him die or set him free. Problem being, there's a machine exploding glass bottles, unleashing a painful rain of shards at them. Zeke does what he can to save him, utilizing a trash can as a shield, 
but ultimately loses out to the never-ending waves of glass, and Pete is killed, effectively failing his task. The next one is of an even more personal and difficult nature, finding his father strung up in another room, his blood being drained into containers on the ground. And our fairly obvious killer is revealed, an alive Will entering the room. But considering that we don't see him in the trap or the body's face at the meat shop, that was kind of a given. There's not even that many characters left. So what is it that led him down this murderous path, all tied to Zeke? Well, there's more to that pivotal Pete Witness murder. It was all seen by a young Will, and right after seeing his dad killed in cold blood, even though he didn't pull the trigger, Zeke actually saw the boy giving a cautious shush to him through the door before leaving. So sure, he isn't 100% innocent, but ultimately Zeke still did the right thing and squealed on the bad cop. And it's due to this that Will saw a kind of potential ally in his new partner. Of course, he changed his name, he specifically went to the police academy to get assigned to Zeke and all that stuff, and everything about his family is a lie. And he used the drugged up guy for the body at the meat place, even giving him his tattoo. Mm, hidden talents. While he is in some ways a disciple of Jigsaw, he has a different purpose and philosophy. This most clearly is seen in his particular choosing of Kramer's iconography, the pig mask, yet then makes his own puppet, Mr. Snuggles, it to a pig. The whole thing to him is about targeting bad and corrupt cops specifically. People that objectively deserve to die for their misdeeds. That's where the spirals come in. Another of Jigsaw's, but he felt his intentions were too small. Instead of changing one person, he sees it as a metaphor for bigger change. The system itself has to change to ever move forward. Now we get his whole thing here, which does significantly differ from Kramer's own philosophy and motivation behind his games. He would seek out people that weren't admitting to being bad and force them to confront what they had done. And there was at least a small chance that if you did this, you could get your way out of his traps. I mean, most of the time people end up getting melted or burned alive or whatever. You know, it's not exactly fair. But Will's concepts go way past this original idea. They're bad, they should die. And in contrast to John, there is no possible salvation for them. Really, this whole thing has been Zeke's bigger game orchestrated by Will to see if his way of dealing with things that won't happen otherwise, something we saw him dealing with too, all of this on account of him just telling the truth. The big question then becomes, can he finally accept that his own father too was really the head honcho behind all of this dirty business? So far, Zeke has been unwilling to come to terms with his father's own bigger hand in everything, as he was running the show for years and most likely has countless other unsavory dealings from his tenure. That's why the final trap is for Zeke to confront this. There's only one bullet in the gun. You can use it to either straight up kill your pops or shoot a little spiral trigger to save him, but still in a sense not coming to terms with the monster he really is. Ultimately, a sobbing Zeke picks the target, instantly hurling his dad to the ground, but failing Will's test. A mass of police force descend upon the abandoned soap factory. Yes, really. I love all the details behind these ridiculous locations. When breaching the door to the area, a trigger is launched, drawing Marcus back into the air, the strings attached to him resembling a puppet being controlled, also evoking precious Mr. Snuggles. The cops enter, and another rig brings a gun up to Marcus's hand, and and they immediately unleash a wave of bullets into him without a second thought. Zeke is broken and mortified, looking to Will as he escapes in a cargo elevator, offering him a sarcastic shush as he disappears from sight. Oh, lot to dig into there with this crazy and abrupt ending. I mean, obviously the whole black dude drawing a weapon and getting carelessly killed thing, even though he's a legendary cop himself, yeah, there is a lot there. But I'm not sure that discussing Saw 9 is really the place to get into all that. There's lots of bad cops out there that break the laws and act haplessly all in the name of a greater overall supposed justice. That's what they're going for here. Ultimately, Marcus does pay the price for his assumedly many sins in this regard, but Zeke loses as well. He still keeps his father on a pedestal, and that's why this whole thing unraveled in the first place. Them teaming up would have been kind of cool, actually, but alas. Pretty big cliffhanger there to pick up in the already greenlit Saw 10, and so I started to think about where I would like to see the story going forward. I think it would be really interesting to have a damaged Zeke still trying to hunt Will. We already know who the killer is, so it becomes about catching him, you know, and would be another much needed shake up to the formula. More serial killer thriller than police procedural as this admittedly was. The more I marinated on that, I was kind of like, that sounds amazing. So hopefully they keep coming up with fresh stuff for the sequel. Keep distancing it from that continuity that they left behind. However, what I could really see though is make this thing into a trilogy. And that's when you bring back those other dangling plot threads. Like Will has been in league with Gordon and all the others the whole time. They can make it like a much bigger concept. All these people out there killing on in Kramer's name, yet with their own particular ideas as well. Tease that at the end of the third one, Gordon in some ceremonial robes or whatever. Will, we've been 
and expecting you. Boom, cut to credits. People would lose their shit. And it's a straight go for Saw 11. Trust me on this, boys. It'll be gold. We can get this thing to like Saw 20 or something, babies. We can keep this money train going a long time. If anyone at Twisted Pictures is listening, give me a ring a ding dong I am in the book. That about wraps it up for this ending explained on Spiral. I was pleasantly surprised by this one, especially from a series that has grown quite long in the tooth after so many entries. Hopefully they expand further on what worked about this one in upcoming sequels. And honestly, you gotta bring back Rock and Mangala. They're a part of what was successful in this one, and the movie does set up their characters to become actually a lot more interesting going forward. And don't forget, before we go, you can send me requests for any movies or TV shows you'd like to see me explain by sending them my way on any of my social media accounts at Foundflix. What did you guys think of Spiral and its ending? What do you hope to see in Saw 10? Where do you rank this one in the series? Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Foundflix. See you next time.